Hi there, this is Phil Simborg, uh, along with Perry Gartner. I'm uh, one of the founders of the Backgammon Learning Center, where we have 21 teachers from all over the world teaching in nine languages. And we have a unique approach to teaching, which has been proven to be incredibly effective. Uh, and it's very easy to see how it's been effective by talking to or looking at the performance of our students. Not only are they winning tournaments all over the world, but they're recorded a performance rating based on uh, analysis by Extreme Gammon proves that they are much better players after taking lessons than before. And we don't take full credit for this at all. The major credit goes to the students because the main thing that we teach the students is how to learn on their own, how to use Extreme Gammon in particular as a learning tool, and how to use deliberate practice to learn. We don't believe in just playing games and looking at mistakes and talking about each mistake. We think that's a highly ineffective way to improve your game. It's a good way to identify where you have uh, weak weaknesses, but it's not a great way to learn how to um, plug those weaknesses. So I'm going to give you an example of deliberate practice that I recommend to all my students, and I do it myself every day. Once a day, I do this exercise. We know it's very important to get the early part of the game done well, and I've spent years looking at the first and second roll moves, and I've got them down pretty well. I can't swear that I get them all right every single time. The first moves I do, but the second roll, sometimes I might miss one or two and forget, but I know what they are. But the third roll I've gone to now. So here's what I do. I made a list of all possible third rolls, and I'm attacking one a day. And here's what I would do. Here's a sample. Let's pretend that I have an opening roll of a 5-2. And I move the 5-2 the proper way. This is the proper move for 5-2. And now I give my opponent a second roll. It doesn't matter what it is, but in this case, I'm going to give it a roll that I know lots of people have problems with, double six. Blue now rolls double six. And now I need to know how to play the next roll. And I go through every single roll, starting with one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, and all the way up, and see how Extreme Gammon plays every roll. First of all, I make my own selection, decide, uh, think carefully about it. If I'm very, very confident, then I'll hit the button and see what Extreme Gammon says. If I'm not that sure, I'll think about it longer and try and come up with reasons for it. But I can promise you that. Uh, especially the ones are very, very difficult to play here, and people would get a lot of these wrong. I'm not going to go through every one of them with you, but let me just go through the ones. So I start with putting up the dice and putting it up a 1-1, one, one. and I ask myself, how would I play 1-1? One, one? Well, I'm pretty confident that I want to make the five point because it's almost always right to make the five point when you can. Now, where's the other two? Uh, lots of plays that I have thought about, and by the way, I have studied this at some point in the past. It's been a long time since I've done this one. I might get something wrong, but it's very surprising, I think, to most people that you make the three point, that it's right to go ahead and make the anchor. Even though he's well ahead in the race, you also don't want to get blitzed. An anchor is a very solid position. By keeping the split or slotting another point, you give him the opportunity to unstack and attack. So I'm pretty sure that was the right play with the double one. I'm going to put it back. I'm going to hit the button. And sure enough, it's the right play. The second best play is simply to make the three points. So the anchor seems to be very, very important. Given a choice between just making the anchor or just making the five point, making the anchor on your opponent's side seems to win the battle. So that's a very interesting concept. And now that I've stopped and thought about it, it's very likely that I'll get this right over the board when it comes up. Because this play might not come up for six months or three months. Who knows? As much as I play, it could come up tomorrow. Uh, I play about four, four days a week, uh, uh, several hours a day. Plus, I teach several hours a day. It could come up. But whether it does or not, I'm going to remember because I remember the concept. The main thing that's helping me remember it is that uh, not that the best play is... Uh, remembering the best play, but remembering the difference between if I choose between making a point on my opponent's side of the board or mine, my opponent's is more important at this time. 
uh, is a saying that Joe Sylvester taught me called offense, offense, defense, defense. When you're on the offense, tend to make a more offensive play. And when you're on the defense, tend to make a more defensive play. If you were in a war and you had more troops and more uh, uh, planes and more ammunition, you would attack. You would be offensive. But if your opponent or your, your um, enemy had more planes and more troops, you wouldn't attack. You would dig in. You'd be defensive. Same thing. Backgammon's a war. Offense, offense, defense, defense. So here's a chance to do a little offense and a little defense. But this is what is going to remind me to make the point with the double one. It's also going to help me a lot with other roles. For example, the next role is a 2-1. How would I play a 2-1? Well, <laughs> it just taught me how important it is to make a point. I'm going to put my 2 here, and that makes the 1 automatic. I just learned from the previous one, and look at that. Anything else is a major, major blunder, and I'm sure a lot of people, until they look at this or uh, studied this on their own or saw this video possibly, would not make the right play here. Uh, they might slot 2 points. They might keep these apart. The 3-1... What did we learn so far? Wow, this is, this is really cool. With a 3-1, I can make the 5-point or I can make his 4-point. Well, I've already learned that lesson with the double ones. I'm going to make his 4-point. This is a no-brainer now, and I don't have much thought to do. See, I'm bunching these ideas into one category and one type of uh, place in my brain where they're all going to be coming together and be easily uh, accessed. Uh, and I'll remember them. And I understand why now. I understand the importance of making the anchor. How about a 4-1? Think about it for a second. How would you play a 4-1? Okay. Uh, the 1, I think, is pretty obvious. I'm going to slot the 5 point. And where's the 4? Do I, I, I don't want to come down and give him another blot, give him more to shoot at. Uh, I can slot another point, or I can come up. Uh, coming up gives them a lot of uh, hitting and shooting, especially with this blot here that I'm not wild about. So I think uh, uh, the right play is to slot another point. Uh, it's keep these back a little further so that even if he does attack, he's not attacking on the real points that he wants to make. And I'm setting up to make more points on my board. So I would slot two points with a 4-1. Let's see what the boss says. Sure enough, it's correct. And uh, by the way, I do look at these differences. 3% uh, is a lot. Uh, I don't want to make, uh, I, I think anything less than 0.01, I wouldn't be too concerned about a 1% error. But uh, anything more than that, I would really be concerned about. And even if it's only 1%, I want to know the logic behind it because that will help me in future roles and future plays. Uh, let's finish the, the series of 5-1. Uh, obviously, I, I'm not going to come out to here and give him an easy shot and leave this checker stranded. Uh, and I, I, I could slot two points inside. That might be right. I know the one goes here, uh, uh, but the five, um, well, I'll tell you what. I probably, I might well have slotted two points before, but I've done this exercise before. It's been a while, but I'm pretty sure I remember it's right to bring the five down and slot because I don't want to point this deep in the board down in the two point. So, uh, and I, again, I know I don't want to come out and strand this checker and give him an easy, uh, easy shot out here. So down and, and slot the five point would be right. Let's see if it's right and by, yes, it's right by quite a bit. Again, slotting two points wouldn't be horrible, but I, I don't want to be uh, slot that low uh, as much. Then my last play is a six one. How, do you, how would you play a 6-1? Give it some thought. Again, the 1 seems to be right just about every time, unless I can make a point over here. The 1 is almost always here. Now the 6. Again, I learned before the concept of coming out is not good. Uh, and uh, I don't want to strand this checker. I want to make an advanced anchor, even though he's rolled the double 6s, and I don't want to be uh, pounded and, and blitzed. So uh, it looks like the 6 has to be to the 2 point. Let's see if I'm right. I would play the 6 to the 2 point. There it is. It's right. And again, I'm not a genius. What we're doing is we're developing uh, references and memory uh, from doing this over and over and over again. And uh, uh, and studying it. I don't think you can learn it and know these all just by doing it one time. 
Uh, I think, uh, again, I do this every day, so maybe in a month or two, I will get to get back to the same sequence of, of uh, five, two, double six, maybe, well, maybe a couple months. There's, a, there's enough different combinations. Uh, so then when I'm done with the ones, of course, I'll go on to do double two, just for the heck of it, because I think double two is one of the more really interesting ones that people would get wrong uh, a lot. Uh, and uh, there's several ways to play it. And course the first thing that comes to mind is making my opponent's five point but that seems to be up awfully high I can make my four point which is a very very valuable point with two and make this point and bring one more down safely that seems like a reasonable option but what I've learned is that making points on my side of the board are not as important as making points on my opponent's side of the board so I know the first two is here I don't have any question that the first two is here. Now I've got three more, and I can make this point and bring one down, or I can continue and make his five point. I would never have continued and made his five point the first time I did this, the first time I saw it, but I remember that it's right. I would, I would have made this play and this play. Or maybe I would even think about bringing two here and making this block here and slotting here to make it harder for him to get off this point. It seems like 13, 11, 2 makes a lot of sense. It turns out that that's a very poor play. The right play is to make the golden point. The, the opponent's five point is called the golden point. Let me show you that it's the right play. And by quite a bit, making the golden point is important. And then, of course, the last one is to slot the four point. I failed to mention how we do that. But 13, 11, 2, well, you really have to plus plus these. And if you really want to be a purist, you need to roll all these out. I think Stick has rolled all these out. And by the way, I have two in a program called Opening Ceremony. You can buy it at www.bgopeningceremony.com. All the third combination rolls are rolled out to the uh, uh, over 5,000 times to make sure you get these right in every combination. You can do it with Opening Ceremony. Uh, not all of my students have paid the $35 to buy opening ceremony, and I'm not pushing it. I don't want to push my own products, although I think it's a very good product. Uh, but uh, this is another approach that I think is also a very, very good approach to, uh, to bunching and solving and learning uh, the game. But the key thing, again, that we teach at the Backgammon Learning Center is we give you the key concepts. We give you the great best tools and approach so that you can learn on your own. Uh, we Most of our students take lessons once a week for an hour. You're not going to become a great backgammon player for once, even at once a week for an hour. It's all those hours in between. If you use them well to study and practice and learn and exercise, doing exercises like this. Now, the other problem is why don't people, why doesn't everybody do this? It's boring. No, wrong. It's not boring if you really think it's interesting and if you really know that you're learning and you treat it as a test or a quiz to just to see how well you do. Testing yourself and quizzing yourself is fun. And every now and then when you get a big surprise and then you have to figure out the puzzle and the logic and the, and the reason of why you made the play you made, uh, it gets to be really fun. I hope this was a fun exercise for you. I hope it helps you improve your game. And by the way, this can be used not just for third role plays. You can set up any kind of position, any kind of common position, and see how you would play from there. Uh, I do this a lot also for containment games. I figured out when do I slot the back of the prime? When do I slot an open point when he's on the bar? Or when do I not slot? Uh, at what point do I, do I break the back uh, anchor? Uh, all these things by going through every possible role from a given position and uh, it, it puts them in a way that you're likely to remember very very well how to make the plays so uh, thank you for watching and thank you uh, for those of you who have supported the backgammon learning center and we'll see you at some point in the future any comments questions don't hesitate to email me at pjsimborg at gmail.com thank you Bye.